Well, welcome. Um, it's really fantastic to um, have you here um, this evening. And um, if it is your um, first time uh, at a Surrey Chapel event, um, I'm just going to say it's great to have you here. Um, if you're a regular at Surrey Chapel, um, it's also really lovely to have you here. Maybe you're a family member and um, you're joining us. Um, it's brilliant to have you here this evening. Um, uh, in case you don't know where Surrey Chapel is, um, Surrey Chapel is uh, down by Anglia Square. It is the um, church building that doesn't actually um, look like a um, church. And um, here we go. I am, I'm not on mute, am I? You can all hear me. This is fine. Yeah, there we go. We're getting a nod. Great. Um, with a church that doesn't look like a church. So actually, we used to be a Shoemaker's Guild building. Um, we are just by the Ring Road. You've probably driven past us a number of times. Anyway, that's, that's where we're based. And it is fantastic that you've been able um, to join us. I'm going to be um, interviewing uh, Jeremy Marshall. I'll introduce you to him in a moment. Uh, but before um, we meet him, Kieran is going to um, explain to us how to use um, Slido. So there's an opportunity for you to ask Jeremy any questions you want. He's going to put um, lots of stuff out there about his story. And um, Kieran, do you want to just show us how Slido works? Yes. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen so you can see. Hopefully you can all see that now. So um, Slido is just a really easy um, way to ask questions. So I've shared the link in the chat for you. So you should just be able to click that. And once you do, then you um, come here. Uh, you'll see the Hope event is there. Um, and you literally just type your question. Um, and you can put your name in, it's optional, or you can ask it anonymously, uh, and then simply just send it. And there you go, and it's sent. Um, and you'll be able to see all the questions in there that people ask. It's kind of a live feed, um, and um, that's kind of how we're going to be doing the, the questions. So don't send your questions in the Zoom chat, send your questions in the uh, um, in this Slido event instead. Uh, any questions, feel free to, to message me. And, and you can find those, Kieran. How do you find the Slido link? It's on the chat. I've just sent it on the chat to everyone. So there it is. It's on the chat. So um, if you click on that, then you can go to Slido. And if you have any questions during this evening, type them in and um, we can ask them um, later on. But I think we're all in. So we will introduce you to um, Jeremy. Jeremy Marshall, um, thank you so much for giving up your evening uh, to be able to meet with us. Where are we speaking to you at? Where are you at the moment? Yeah, hi Andy. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm in um, I'm in Kent, so I'm married to Jeanette. I've got three. Uh, we've got three adult children, one of whom's in Cambridge actually, so not a million miles away. And my other big connection with um, with Norwich is that when I was at university, my two closest friends are both fanatical Norwich City fans, and I'm a very keen Watford fan. So we're very happy, the three of us, with where we're at the moment. You know, one and two. And hopefully both teams can be back in the Premier League where they where they belong. <laughs> There's a lot of rejoicing currently in Norwich. I'm I'm slowly I'm a I'm a Welshman in a foreign land, so I'm I'm getting into the local football. But I know there's a lot of passionate Norwich City fans, a lot of canary nutters within our congregation and with Norwich Forest. Anyway, but that's brilliant. That's a great connection. So tell us, go on, tell us about yourself a bit, Jeremy. Um, how's lockdown been for you? Yeah, it's been hard, um, Andy. Um, I've been, uh, you know, isolating for the last year for reasons we'll come on to for a minute. But um, what I'd say to everybody in a friendly way is kind of welcome to my world, because for the last uh, six years, every time I was on a train or a tube and somebody coughed or sneezed, I was afraid because I haven't got much of an immune system. And now everybody feels like that. And for the last yeah six years, yeah, I've been living with like the fear of death and now to some extent everybody feels like that. So I hope my experience can be, you know, a bridge and, and, and be useful. Um, before, you know, before we get into my medical history, I guess I, I'm afraid by background, I have to confess this, I'm a banker, right? Terrible. Uh, you, can, you can all throw things at the screen. And um, I worked all over the world in, in wealth management, which is dealing with wealthy people, helping wealthy people manage their money. And um, about 12 years ago, then I became chief executive of a family owned private bank called Seahor & Co, which is one of these typical British institutions, uh, 350 years old, still owned by the same family. And they let me loose as the first non-family chief executive. So that was 
that was a lot of fun. And um, the other thing I'd observe, Andy, is from a career, a lifetime spent advising some of the wealthiest people in the world on their finances, is that money doesn't make you happy. Money doesn't make you happy. There's something that Hollywood and the National Lottery and advertising don't, don't tell you. But I've met some incredibly wealthy people who are also very, very unhappy. And I think one reason is that a lot of very wealthy people, that's certainly true in, in banking, are very driven. They're always looking for more. Hmm. And whenever they get to some point, if they make 10 million or 20 million or 50 million or 100 million or 500 million, it's never enough. They always want that little bit extra. They're always somehow unsatisfied. Wow, that, that is fascinating. And so there you're saying that you really were dealing with people who had incredible amounts of money. I mean, that like... It, that's that is fascinating that even the even the people what you're saying with 500 million it wasn't enough no because they compare themselves then with other people with 500 million so look some people are content right some people think i made it and that's that's fine but in general um yeah money doesn't doesn't make you happy and uh, there's a kind of restlessness i think in 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 humanity now so, some of you may be watching at us typical bankers very evil you know driven by money OK, fair enough. But we're all, I'd suggest, driven by something. It might be family. It might be yeah, the arts. It might be anything. And we're all looking for happiness. But I think the Christian claim is that we're looking in the wrong place. OK, well, look, so um, let's talk. talk tell, tell us about your story then. So when, you know, one day changed your life, what happened? It was actually two days, uh, Andy. Sorry. Yeah. So eight years ago, I found a tiny lump on my rib, like a tiny pea. And um, I uh, went to the GP, said, oh, it's just a fatty lump, nothing to worry about. And I got referred. And maybe some of you watching have been through this. You get referred from person to person. And each person says, I don't know quite know what that is. Anyway, in the end, I got referred to the Royal Barston, which only does one thing. So even the dopiest person could figure out it was cancer. This was in uh, early 2013. And they said, uh, look, you've got this really rare type of cancer. It's a type of sarcoma, which is cancer of the muscle tissue but we caught it early and we should be able to deal with it. And I went through treatment for about six months and then I, I went back to normal, I carried on working and um, everything seemed to be okay. And then nearly six years ago, I was at a friend's house here in Seven Oaks, and um, I was having a meal. I went to adjust my collar just here. And as I did that, I felt a massive lump on my collarbone, not like a pea, but like a golf ball. And uh, yeah, within a few seconds, my life changed because I knew straight away what it was. And um, we went back to the hospital, my wife and I, and we were in the waiting room. And uh, the nurse said, yeah, please come through. We were walking down a short corridor and she simply said, I'm really sorry, which was the only warning I had. Because when I got into the room, um, the oncologist there said, look, we're really sorry. We don't know how we missed this. About a year later, they decided it was a completely different, completely unrelated type of cancer. But you've got tumours um, everywhere. And um, unlike the first time, yeah, there's not really a great deal we can do. We can't, we can't get at many of the tumours that they're inoperable. So, of course, Andy, you say, so you know, how long do you think I've got? And being oncologists, they say, well, you know, it all depends, right? But eventually they said, well, yeah, maximum 18 months. So, yeah, that I burst into tears. And, and please don't think I'm some kind of cancer expert or let alone a religious person. I'm a banker, right? That's a, by definition an unreligious type of person. And it's been really hard the last uh, last five, six years. So on the one hand, there's the kind of physical side. So I've had 30 chemotherapies. I've had about a dozen operations. I also lost the sight in both eyes, one after the other. That was pretty scary. In the middle of chemo, that was terrible. Um, although I got it back in one eye after a bit. And then last year I was in hospital quite a bit because I had serious heart problems where I don't know it might have been related to the some of the treatment I had it might have been COVID who knows um, so that's been that's been really hard um, and maybe even harder is the impact than it has on your family on those you love and the more you love someone and the more they love you the more they're affected by that diagnosis mm -hmm. so I had to kind of go home from the hospital and then drive around the UK my children were all at university and, and tell them that I didn't want to uh, tell them over the phone although one of them when we turned up thought that we come to tell him that the dog had died. <laughs> Sometimes humour can can help a bit, but it's been really hard the last uh, last six years. Yeah. So that so it was it was six years ago that you were diagnosed with incurable yeah. cancer. How does that feel in the day to day? 
Yeah, the dominant emotion, um, Andy, I, I, I experience is fear. Fear. That's what I felt. I felt very afraid. Um, afraid of dying maybe more than death. And, you know, I've been with loved ones in hospices and other places, and it's pretty horrible to die of cancer. Mm. Um, the thing that's kept me going in that has been the presence of Jesus Christ in my life. I don't mean in some supernatural way. Again, I'm not a religious person, right? I'm, I'm a banker. But if you think of banking, you know, people write checks, right? And the question is, is the check bankable, right? If you gave me, Andy, a check for 50 million pounds, I might be a little bit sceptical as to whether that check is going gonna, is gonna to bounce. Your wife is put, get, putting her thumbs up behind. She's very confident that it would. So God, if you like, writes us checks, I would say. And the checks are his promises. And uh, the promises of God, uh, which I remember when I'm especially at my low point, are, um, look, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. Or I'll never leave you or forsake you. Or perhaps the most famous chapter in the Bible is the 23rd Psalm, which begins, the Lord's my shepherd. And it goes on to say this. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Now, you were just mentioning about where your church building is on the ring road, right? Well, sadly, there's no ring road around death, right? So being a Christian doesn't mean that we can bypass death. Every one of us has to go through the valley of the shadow of death and We've all, haven't we, friends, somehow been thrust into that valley in the last 12 months. And I've been living in it for quite a while. And God doesn't promise us a bypass. He promises us something much better than that, which is his presence, his presence. And part of his presence is hope as well. And that's something I hope if you're watching and you're not a Christian. And thanks so much for, for, for joining if you are in that position it's I think something that's attractive to people because hope in the face of death is something that is really I've experienced this year and I've done quite a few of these things a lot of people say I'd, I'd like some of that yeah yeah I would like I would like that in fact it's not just hope in the face of death the Christian claim and if you think that's ludicrous please push back in the questions is that we have the answer to death yeah that's what Andy and I are claiming we've got the answer to death that's a big claim right and the answer to death is a person, Jesus Christ. And that person has made an enormous difference to me in the last six years and has given me hope in the face of death. Thank you, Jeremy, for sharing that. Um, I mean, I just this again, just 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 hearing that. Um, surely, you know, when you come to trust in Jesus, shouldn't he make shouldn't it make your life easy? I mean, like, has, hasn't it made you doubt in Jesus goodness that he that you are having to go through this? Well, there's a story in the Bible that speaks very powerfully to me in that, Andy, which is, you know, Jesus one day says to his friends, let's cross the lake and go to the other side. So the disciples, they're sailing away and Jesus goes to sleep. And um, suddenly, and this is in an everyday experience, completely unexpectedly, a bit like COVID or a bit like cancer, out of nothing, a tremendous storm blows up and the boat begins to sink. And the disciples are terrified. And that's that's me. And more than that, the disciples think, God doesn't really care about us. So I think in the storms of life, we may have two thoughts. We may think either there is no God or if there is one, he doesn't care about me. He doesn't even know about me. Because eventually the disciples, very roughly, they shake Jesus and wake him up. Say, don't you care? We're going to drown. What's going on? Well, Jesus wakes up and he rebukes the storm and suddenly there's a dead calm. And then it says something really strange. It says, then Jesus' disciples were even more afraid. So they were more afraid in a mill pond calmness with not a breath of wind than they were just a few seconds earlier where the water was pouring in and the boat was sinking. Why? Because it began to dawn on them who that person in their boat was. That this ordinary looking rabbi asleep was God because only God can, can do what Jesus just did. So that's been that's been my experience. Yeah, that when I and, and to have doubts is OK. And if you're watching this, you've got doubts. That's all right. Being a Christian is not about eliminating all doubts. It's about realizing who Jesus Christ is. And if you're a Christian and you feel sometimes well, what is going on, God, you know, then, then we need to remember, don't we, that Christ is in our boat. And Christ brings the disciples to the other side of the lake and Christ will bring us to the other side of the lake, which is through death to himself. And each one of us has to go through death, doesn't it? It's given to humans once to die. And after that, the judgment says the Bible. And if you haven't got Christ in your boat, then get him. 
because each one of us is going to die. If you're feeling cheery this evening, what's the death rate watching this call? It's 100%, right? Anybody who thinks they're immortal might, not, might try and get some psychiatric help, right? Now we're all going to die. And Jesus Christ is the only way to get through death to the other side. And he, and he wants to be in our boat. He, if you like, invites himself to enter our, our boat. That's wonderful, Jeremy. Thank you. So just, um, I don't know, would, would you answer in a similar way if I was to ask you, you know, why does God then allow coronavirus or cancer? How can God be loving in him actually allowing that to happen? Why doesn't he just fix it? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I think that's the most commonly asked question of Christians. It's certainly the most commonly asked question of me. This is my answer. One, God made the world good. In the beginning, it wasn't like it is now. It was good. Two, evil entered the world, right? And it's obvious if we look around, there's natural evil, isn't there? There's coronavirus, there's cancer, there's car crashes, there's all kinds of things. And there's also, which we're all very expert at identifying, there's lots of evil in other people, especially politicians who we don't agree with or people we don't like. But if we're honest, when we look in the mirror, there's also evil because each one of us have done things that have smashed and destroyed our relationship with God. In fact, more than that, each one of us have said to God, I don't want you in my life. I want to do it my way. I noticed when Donald Trump took off in Air Force One, leaving the White House for the last time, he was blaring out, I did it my way, right? And I've heard that, which is a bit sad, to be honest, at many funerals. So that's the, that, that, that's the message that we give to God by nature. To hell with you, I want to do it my way. So why doesn't God do something about this total mess that we're in? Well, that's the Christian claim that he did do something. And by he, I mean the creator God who created the whole universe. So it's a pretty darn big God. 75 trillion light years across is the universe. But that God saw us on Earth in the mess we're in and became a human being in an obscure corner of the Roman Empire 2000 years ago. And that that man, God, Jesus Christ, Christians believe Jesus is 100 percent God and 100 percent human, was like nobody else before or since. For example, that he could raise the dead, which is a jolly useful thing to do. If you wanted to draw a crowd, Andy, go to Norwich, you know, cathedral graveyard and say, I'm going to be raising the dead tomorrow. You'll, you'll draw a crowd. You might also draw the local. Um, yeah, all, all sorts of people. <laughs> so, the amazing thing is that Jesus not only had that power, but that he also suffered. He also suffered. So Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was arrested and then crucified on a travesty of trumped up charges of which he was completely innocent, said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. But let not my will, but your will be done. By the cup, he meant the cup of suffering, the cup of evil, the cup of death. And he drank that cup and he went to the cross and he knew what was coming. So why? What, what, why was that the way back to God? Why, why was that the way that God would do something about it? Well, Christians believe that by nature, we have this giant Grand Canyon, if you like, between us and God. There's God and we're made for God. We, we can only find happiness in, in going home to him. And we can't get home because of the evil, not just in the world, but the evil in us. And God throws down a bridge. And that bridge is, is Jesus Christ and specifically his death. And in his death, he pays the bill for all the things that we've done wrong, for all the evil, all the consequences of the evil that we've done, that we deserve. He takes it on himself. And, and what must we do to cross this bridge? Nothing. We, we must just believe that the bridge brings us back to God. That's it. There's no, you don't, the Christian message is not about being good or being religious. It's about trusting in Jesus Christ and believing in his death. We can come back. And what motivated God to throw down that bridge? Love 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 for poor lost humanity he, he, he saw us in the terrible state we're in and he was moved he wanted to do something about it a man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor who stood up against the persecution of the Jews as a result was executed under Nazi Germany and um, just before he died he smuggled out of his jail cell a little piece of paper and on it he'd written this only a suffering God can help us only a suffering God can help us now, the eternal creator God who made the universe can't suffer because to suffer is to change and, 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 and to be formed, if you like. But, but Jesus, by being human, as well as being divine, could suffer and did suffer. And why did he suffer? Because he loves us. 
That's wonderful. So like the, um, so given your prognosis, given your prognosis, um, um, isn't it just all wishful thinking um, that, that actually look, there is hope beyond death and, and that, that you, you can rest assured in that now, aren't you just, aren't you basically believing in fairies at the bottom of the garden? Yeah, that's a good question also, Andy. And um, a variant of that, which is maybe a slightly more polite one, is that people say, well, if it's good for you, that's fine, right? If, if I was in your situation, I understand how you feel and that's fine. It doesn't, doesn't work for me, but it's fine for you. Your truth, if I may use the expression, right? Now, I would suggest that there's two broad worldviews. There are a few more, right? And if, if you think my view is one of the two I'm going to set out, okay, please, please ask a question. So one view is well set out by the person who's done more for Christianity than anybody, I would say, in the last, say, 30 years, which is Richard Dawkins of the University of Oxford, the author of The God Delusion. And why I appreciate Dawkins, that he's very honest. He's very honest because we don't really like to think about death, do we? Most people in England, when we think about death, we, we, when we go to funerals or cremations, we talk about the person being in the other room, some kind of ill-defined other thing there but Dawkins says no 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 there's no god what does the universe say to us nothing the universe speaks to us a blind pitiless indifference to quote professor Dawkins blind pitiless indifference there's no god there's no other life this is all it is it's all ultimately meaningless because all that's going on is just perpetuation of dna one person's dna mine for example may be bad Another person's maybe great, they live to 100, but who cares really ultimately? Even DNA itself has no purpose. Now, the Christian view is 180 degrees the opposite of that, which is there is a purpose to life and the purpose is to know God and to enjoy him forever. And that there's a loving God who made us and who invites us to come home. He invite the father, if you like, sends the son and, and invites us to come home to him, crossing that bridge, crossing the cross, coming back home. And that because of that, there is hope in the face of death, which is great if you're in my position. But it's only it's only great. It's only of any use if it's true. Right. That's kind of rather obvious. I hope you would agree. It's only helpful if it's true. Otherwise, indeed, it is indeed wishful thinking. And more than that, it's actually a delusion. And more than that, it's actually the biggest contrary in human history. Right. So Christianity stands or falls on this question. Is it true? What do I mean by it? It I mean really one thing and one thing only, which is on the morning of Easter Sunday, AD 33 or 34, the four eyewitness accounts that we've got, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, say that if you were there with an iPhone, I don't literally say that, I'm expanding on it, you could have recorded the stone being rolled away and Jesus who'd been dead for three days coming back to life, physically, literally, not metaphorically, not in the spirit of the disciples, no, literally. And that the disciples could touch him, he could eat food, and it wasn't just one or two people who were maybe, I don't know, had one or two magic mushrooms that morning for breakfast. No, he was seen by 500 people at once, right? Half the capacity of Carrow Road, I'm just kidding, right? But a lot of people, really lots and lots and lots of people saw him. And if that's true, if that happened 2,000 years ago, then that means we have the answer to death. And that longing for that answer is very powerful. Eddie Izzard, the comedian, was interviewed in The Guardian and he said, um, all my life I've been traumatised by the death of my mother when I, Eddie, was six or seven. And if only she or someone had come back through the clouds to tell us there's something there, which is a perfectly fair thing to say. But it is also the Christian claim that 2000 years ago, someone came back. And more than that, that now, today in 2021, they offer us the following choice, life or death. Jesus stands in front of a grieving sister who's grieving her brother and he says to her, don't cry, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. Do you believe? And what does Jesus mean by that? Because he offered, he's offering us life. He's offering not just an answer to death, we all have to go through death, but being Christians we believe that when we go through death we'll, we'll meet God, but also a way to defeat the much more important second death. And second death is rejection of God and turning away from God for all eternity. And God doesn't want anyone to do that. It's a form of madness to reject God. It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to deliberately turn our back on God. 
So being a Christian is realizing or becoming a Christian is realizing I've, I've gone the wrong way. This is crazy. I'm, I must come back to the father. And how do we know? How do we know, if you like, that that bridge back is going to it exists or is going to hold us? Well, if you think of a check, what does a check have to make it valid? It has a signature, right? So what's the resurrection? It's God's signature. God signs it. Yes, Jesus is the son of God. And that's the claim. That's the central claim of Christianity. You have to figure out if it's true or not. If it's not true, Christianity is a complete and utter charade and a waste of time. But if it is true, and Jesus claims at the end of the Bible, he says, I have the keys of death and hell. That means not only something happened 2000 years ago, but there's some answer we can have now, Jesus Christ today, and also Jesus Christ in the future. Because what's being a Christian, and I'll end with this, it's about going home. It's about going home. It's about going home to God, the God who made us, the God who we're designed for, the God who invites us to come back to him. The last verse of the 23rd Psalm is this. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mm -hmm. That is a summary of where the Christian's going. So knowing that Jesus rose from the dead means something that happened 2000 years ago transforms and changes everything about our life today and gives us a certain hope of where we're going. Thank you. That is a really um, helpful summary. And actually, um, at that point, there is people have been um, asking some questions online. And um, um, and actually, if you want to ask Jeremy any questions about anything he said, go go on to Slido and you can type in your questions. Um, and I'll just before we sort of take to those questions, just just thinking, what do people do um, with what you are saying? Here? You know, how do you think folks take take this further? And then we, we can go on to some of the questions. Yeah, I would say, Andy, kick the tires. Right, what do I mean by that? I'm making huge claims, right? I'm, I'm claiming that Jesus Christ has the answers to death. We, we're very happy for having a vaccine for COVID, but the Christian claim is we have a vaccine for death itself. Now, if I tried to sell you a car, let's say, if I was a secondhand car salesman, a noble profession, no insult to anyone who sells cars for a living, um, what would you do? You would go and have a look at the car, right? You would You would look into the car. And you would go and test drive it and you would kick the tires, you would look under the bonnet, you would see what it was like, right? For a car, which costs, you know, maybe a few thousand pounds. This, friends, is the most important thing in the universe. Nothing is more important than this. Is Jesus who he said he was? So do the same thing. Look into it. I'm not asking you to believe something that's not true. I'm not asking you to take a leap of faith. I'm not asking you to be religious. I'm asking you to look into who Jesus Christ was. Now, how do you do that? Well, there are various possibilities. I think you've got a course, Andy, which is uh, called Christianity Explore, which is just sitting around and chatting about some of the eyewitness evidence. You can come as sceptical as you like. Or I'm sure if you say I don't like group stuff. Um, yeah, anyone in the church would be happy to have a chat with you bilaterally and be as sceptical as you like. It's, found, it's fine to have doubts. Every person who became a Christian started with doubts. They started with questions. And eventually they found an answer. And the answer is Jesus Christ. Brilliant. OK, thank you, Jeremy. That's great. And um, I'll talk a bit at the end of our time together about if you're interested in Christianity Explored or there's a few other things uh, that we've got coming up um, as a church that might help you. Um, uh, if you've if you've got questions, you want to pursue some of the things Jeremy has been talking about. Uh, but l let me start here. Um, um, how do you make plans for the future? Or do you just live one day at a time? Uh, should we be making plans for the future or should we just live in the present? That was one question. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's not in the Bible, but it's true. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, right? So if you read my book, which I, I've forgotten very badly to plug, um, I've got two books. This is one of them, Beyond the Big Sea, um, which is basically an expanded version of what I've just told you about. I use the analogy of being on a train line, right? Because in Seven Oaks, I used to go into work all the time. And if you're you know, getting on the train in Seven Oaks, your destination is London Bridge or Victoria or wherever. And I guess we're all a bit like that, aren't we, with our plans? We think, you know, what's, I don't know, it depends what stage of life, but in my, I'm in my 50s, right? So you think I'm going to retire and, you know, maybe, maybe you get grandchildren. I don't know. You have to be careful raising that subject, right? And uh, we'll see what happens. But suddenly on that train, suddenly there's a big jolt and you're switched onto a different line. Now the line isn't marked retirement 
although of course retirement isn't the final terminus in the first line but we don't like to think about that do we because it's a bit ugly to mention death and this time the destination says 18 months and the grim reaper comes if you like and enters the carriage and sits opposite you and starts looking at you so yeah i think i think i I, i've given up on trying to plan things i mean even small things like holidays several times i've had holidays and they've had to be cancelled or disrupted because i was because i was ill so yeah i do just try and live in it you know in the immortal words of the football manager (laughs) take each game at a time take each day at a time and also andy just be happy just be happy for each day in banking we get bonuses right at the end of the year we used to before the regulators clamped down on them and um, someone would give you a you know a check at the end of the year and it was extra something beyond what you expected um but i I feel like every day of life is a bonus now every day god gives me have another day and here's another one and another one and another one and that's great so i really i really am happy to be alive Hmm. That's, that's really helpful. Look, how has your view of Jesus changed since the diagnosis? Yeah, was a, that's a great question, too. I was a Christian before. Um, I would say the reality of Jesus Christ has come home to me very powerfully, um, especially his power over his power over death. So there's a great story, Andy, in the Bible, which really appeals to me. Um, I speak on it maybe more than any other, which is a very short story where Jesus meets a grieving widow. Her eyes are full of tears and her son's been carried off to death. It's a kind of COVID story, basically. And what's Jesus like? And when I look at that story and others like that, that just kind of resonates with me. And I feel, wow, this guy's amazing. So he's got two characteristics. One, he's full of kindness and compassion. And he's also right there, right in front of the fact that the stretcher bearers have to stop because he's standing right in the way. And he's standing right in my way and he's standing right in your way. And what does he show to this poor grieving lady? Kindness and compassion. It says Jesus, Jesus was deeply moved. Um, he also then does something really strange. He reaches out and he touches the dead body, which no rabbi would do because it makes you richly unclean. So I've experienced that. I've experienced the kindness and the compassion of Jesus in my life. And I believe that's what he's like. And I've also experienced his presence. I believe that that touch, if you like, I don't mean again a mystical experience, but yeah, that 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 God is is with me, is near to me. And then the other thing he does is he raises the boy back from the dead and gives him back to his mother. Now maybe that begs the question: Well, you're not healed, no. But I believe God will do that to to to. In fact, believe God, God will do that to everybody, whether we believe in Him or not. That we will all be resurrected. But if we trust in Him. If we realize what he's like, full of kindness and compassion and power, then he will take us to be with himself. So I would say, what have I learned? I've learned what Jesus is like more than I knew before. That's wonderful. So, look, um, how have you practically dealt with any anger or fear you've felt towards God during this time? I've never felt anger, um, but some people have. Right. Everybody's different. I think, first of all, like. God can cope with our emotions. So if you're watching this and you're angry with God or you're disillusioned or you wonder if God's there, that's OK. God, God, God knows what you're feeling like. There's no point trying to pretend. What I felt is that thing I described before, Andy, with the storm, right? That God, what? please, please don't you care. I'm just I'm going to drown under all this stuff going on. Mm. And there I believe he, he, he gives us grace for the situation we're in. Yeah. It gives us grace for the situation we're in. And if you think of walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, for, for there to be a shadow, there must be a light. Have you thought about that? Otherwise, it would just be total darkness. And there is a light and the light is coming from Jesus Christ. Now, there is also a shadow, but the darker the valley, then the brighter the light. And that's been my experience. And I believe that can be yours as well. This is, I, please don't think of something particularly good or noble about me, not at all. I'm just like a person who's found a vaccine cure for COVID and I want to tell everybody about it. Uh, I found the person I believe has the answer to death and, and holds the keys of death and hell and I want to tell everybody about it. So look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm aware that um, um, the issues you are talking about, lots of people who are on the call here there'll be people who will maybe have a family member 
um, who is in a similar position to you, what would you want to say to them? It's the question, Andy, how should we as Christians sort of behave towards them? Well, I guess what would you, um, um, you know, what would you, what would you want to say to the family member of someone in a similar position to you? I think, first of all, Andy, we have to be just, as I said, like, like Jesus, full of kindness and compassion. And um, yeah, if the person wants, if you like, I've, I've used this boat analogy, but to allow us to come into their boat with them alongside them and, 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 and sympathize with them. If it was a family, a friend, we're talking about a friend of mine, right? Somebody I knew. But I think what we sometimes do then is we try and grab hold of the tiller. And that's not, that's not correct. That's not what Jesus does either. You know, Jesus is standing at the grave of Lazarus and he, and he cries. He weeps. He's, he's deeply moved. Yeah. Then I, I think I, I would say to, a, or I have said to, to friends of mine who, who are not Christians in that situation, I'd say simply this, would you mind if I prayed for you? Which, and I've said that to people because you get to know the people in chemotherapy as well, because you go the same day every, every, you know, every week, every month. Or whatever. Would you mind if I prayed for you? And no one's ever said, don't pray for me, because if you're in a dire situation, what have you got to lose? But if they did say no, that, that's fine. Um, so I think just to try and, yeah, just to try and support and encourage and, and help those people who are, who are troubled. I think we have to be careful as Christians not to glibly quote proof texts. Yeah. Romans 8 is a dangerous chapter. There are a few verses in it which I think can be thrown out and they're not always that helpful. So just sometimes to listen to people, see what, see where they're at. Practical help can also be really good. Yeah, I'm talking about you know people you know. Just uh, a thing that was very helpful for us when I first got really ill was just cooking. Actually, yeah, people in the church, just cooking in the church has been great. Our church here, they've been so friendly and kind. It's like having a an extended family. So yeah, with people around us who are troubled or have got you know, I've got a, a, a difficult situation just to be like the Lord Jesus, to be kind, compassionate, listen. And if they allow us to then pray for them. And another thing I might do is if they said, I, I said, would you mind if I read you a psalm? Mm. I find the psalms are just amazingly comforting because also they deal with every human emotion. Every human emotion is in the Bible. The Bible isn't like a kind of package list of do's and don'ts. No, it's about human beings. 3,000 years ago, in the case of the Psalms, wrestling with anger, with doubt, with loneliness, with all the things that we experience today and finding an answer. So I, I believe being a Christian is going up the mountain with questions and coming back with the answer. Look, just I mean, just that's helpful. Just out of interest, what Psalms you know, would you go to? What Psalms have been a particular friend to you? Yeah. How long have you got? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we talked about 23. Another, but it'd be my, it, actually, that's a perfect segue into my second book, Andy, <laughs> Hope in the Face of Suffering. Rather stupidly, I forgot to agree any royalties for either of these best-selling books. So I don't get any money for them. But the most quoted book in this, and both books are really, um, really small. They're about 12,000 words. So you can read them in an hour or so. And the chapters are really short. They're like, you know, one, one, one or two pages each is the psalms so here i've got like psalm 34 psalm 16 yeah psalm 103 psalm 31 here's, here's a good verse in psalm 31 as for me i trust in you my times are in your hand so one other great thing about being a christian is our times our life our, our the day we die are in the hands of god they're not in the hands of some blind random fate as Mr. Dawkins would say, we're, you know, just chucking the dice, see what happens. And nor are they in our own hands, because if they were, we'd make a total mess of them. No, they're in the hands of God. And what, what are those hands like? Those hands have got nail holes in them. Those hands have nail holes in them. So the hands of God, the hands that hold the universe, the hands of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, have nail holes in them because, because of the love that God has for us. So I find that verse immensely reassuring. And what must we do if we're Christians is we must trust, right? Belief. I think people talk about belief and maybe in English we think of, yeah, 
I believe that Norwich City are going to get promoted, right? They probably will. They are. I hope they will, but they might not. But the Christian belief is not just an intellectual ascent. It's a, it's a trust. It's like giving the keys of our life to Jesus Christ. It, it's, it's like putting our foot on that bridge to cross back to God and saying, yeah, I trust that this bridge can hold me despite all the things I've done wrong, despite all the appalling things I've done in my life. I believe that that bridge will, will bring me back home. So, yeah, belief is more than just intellectual ascent. We, we may intellectually ascent that Jesus is God, but it doesn't do us any good unless we trust our life in, into his, unless we place our hands in his hand unless we try and obey him and, and also unless we unless we're sorry for the things that have put put us in the big mess in the first place yeah. i mean if, you, if you've got a second andy there's a great story in the bible which if you want to you can look it up luke 15 which is the story of the prodigal son and in it the the younger son is in a pigsty and he realizes this is crazy I'm, I'm just in such a mess what am i doing here i must come back to the father the father being god and while he's a great way off, all covered in pig muck, the father sees him and runs to him and throws his arm around him and, and welcomes him home. So that's a picture of being a Christian, realising that we're in the pigsty, realising that I need to come home. And then, oh, wonderful joy, God meets us as we take that first step of faith back, a first step of trust. We're met by God who embraces us and makes us not a slave as the, 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 the younger son in the story thinks. I'm not worthy to be a son, but maybe I could be a slave. No, God makes us sons and daughters of the creator God of the whole universe. It's just amazing. Um, that's just amazing. And I guess like if I was um, a cynic listening in, I'd want to say, okay, how I need to look into this to see if that is true. Um, Cause it's such a huge thing to say. Can I say, I've just had our, um, outreach worker text me to remind to just remind me to say look we have got um the book that you have been um talking about these um devotions hope in the face of suffering we've got um a load of them at church and if you would find that helpful um you can contact um surrey chapel through uh the church website there's there's a there's an email um there's a place you can contact the church through the church website and just say please send me a copy of that book we've also got a load of copies of this as well that we'd love to pass on to you um so um if you would like to get either of those books being that jeremy's just um plugged them um then we would really happily send them on on to you so um contact the church and we can send you that information uh jeremy have you got time for just um um two more questions is that okay Please. um just um so again so just some i mean i think we've probably touched around this but um do you i guess do you ever ask god why me or do you ever feel more why not me i mean that, that's one question that a few people have yeah asked. i do i do feel why me um and you know i i don't know the answer <laughs> i don't know i don't know but that that comes back to what i've been saying is god is god there and is he trustworthy hmm. Is he trustworthy? So becoming a Christian is also like becoming a little child. And what do little children do? They put their hands in the hands of the parent, right? Mm. And the parent may take them sometimes to places that they don't particularly want to go, like to have a vaccine, right, for measles or something. Mm. But the, the, the parent, the child is in safe hands because the parent loves them and they are, they are, they belong to the parent. So that's what I rest my faith on. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't know why we, well, one answer maybe, I guess, so I can do things like this. If I was busy making lots of money and banking, I wouldn't be speaking at Surrey, at Surrey Chapel, right? What was the second part of that question? Well, no, that's it. It's, it was that, do you ever feel why me or do you feel more why not me? Yes, I, I guess I, I guess I try to answer that. Yeah, I, I, Fine, I do happy. feel that and I don't know the answer, but I trust that God has a plan and, and I'm happy to be part of that. Yeah. And look, um, just another question as well. How, how has your family coped with all of this? Yeah, it's been hard, Andy. Yeah, it's been really hard. That's the hardest part of cancer, because the more someone loves you, the more they're impacted. And also, you know, being a callous son, I didn't even, when I went to tell my mother, she was, yeah, I didn't even think about that. I thought about my kids. She was really upset and said, I, I wish it was me, right? I wish it was me, which touched me, touched me greatly. So look, the, I don't have an answer to that either. I can't, I can't do anything about it, right? I'm just stuck with this stupid thing and, and the impact it has on those i love but i also believe that eventually god will make everything that's wrong right that's what people say maybe what what's heaven like well it's it's the it's the elimination of death of pain of suffering 
Now, there is an alternative choice to heaven, which is to go away from God, the place with the absence of God, what the Bible calls hell. But what's heaven? That's where God is. And what will that be like? Well, imagine you have a toddler and you're in the garden one day and the toddler goes running off down the path and trips over and cuts his or her knee and they come back to you crying. Right. What do you do? You put the toddler on your knee, you get out a tissue, I hope a clean one. You wipe the child's eyes, you wipe the knee. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about a kind of, you know, flaps of skin hanging off the usual sort of toddler scrapes. After you know, 60 seconds or so, the child's perfectly happy and runs off, right, and play, playing again. That's the picture that the Bible tells us of God with us. But God himself will wipe away every tear. God will personally wipe away every tear. And this life is sometimes grim. It's also sometimes good. And it's also sometimes, yeah, full of pain and sadness. And God himself will wipe away every tear. So when we go home to be with God, death itself will be swallowed up. I just had a, I had a, I'm, I'm, I'm in lockdown. My cooking has improved no end. I, I cooked a, a chicken pad thai with some help from uh, one or two uh, packaged elements. Anyway, I did make some of it myself. And I ate it and it's gone, right? It's gone. It's disappeared. Mm. The Bible says God himself will eat death. Death itself will die. And things will be put back to the way they should have been in the beginning. And that's the open invitation. Come home. Heaven's not a place with people floating around on clouds. No, it's a place utterly beyond our wildest imagination, which will be absolutely amazing because we'll, we'll be with God and we'll see Jesus face to face. We'll also realize that in the center of the whole universe, it's a human being, Jesus Christ. And, and everything that's gone wrong and everything that's sad in this life will be utterly eliminated. Hmm. Well, Jeremy, that is um, just um, really brilliant to hear. And, and can I say, I think we will, um, I think we are going to draw stumps there in terms of the questions. Um, but Jeremy, uh, let me just um, say um, on behalf of the church and um, any other people watching, thank you so much um, for being willing to be so open um, and honest with us tonight about your experiences, um, about um, just uh, the hope that you have found in Jesus and the truth of, um, of, of his um, resurrection. And I guess if, if there are people who are watching who want to find out more, there's a few things that we can tell you about as a church. Kieran, do you want to just stick these um, slides up of what is coming up for us as a church? So um, coming up on um, Easter weekend, um, there's a number of services um, that people can come to. Let's have a look. There we go. So on, on Good Friday, um, you can join us um, 10 o'clock on, on YouTube or um, in person at the church service. We'll be thinking about what happened that um, first um, Good Friday. Uh, then Saturday, there's a family Easter trail. You can find out about that online. Then on, on Easter Sunday, there is a resurre resurrection celebration service. Again, you can look at that on YouTube or you can join us in person and um, that, again, that would be a wonderful opportunity just to be able to consider uh, the historicity and um, the, the results of Jesus um, uh, rising from the dead. Um, and then following that, we have um, a course called Christianity Explored, as Jeremy has already um, mentioned. Um, that will be starting. Oh, we said the two books, but there we go. We've got that will be starting on Monday, the 19th of April. And again, um, it's it's just a course that we absolutely love running. It doesn't matter. Um, what your experience of Christianity has been. Maybe you're a complete skeptic. Uh, maybe you've been a Christian for years and you just want to brush up on the basics. Wherever you're at, whatever your background, it's an opportunity to come and have a look at um, the eyewitness uh, material of um, Jesus' life. Uh, Mark's Gospel is a short talk and you can just talk about um, um, you know what you're finding there and I've found lots of people in Norwich um, who have got genuine questions have found that really a really helpful course you can just come to the first night you don't have to return if you don't like it will be on zoom so you can do it from the safety of your own home as it were uh, but if you want to come to that you can find more details of that on um, the Surrey Chapel website and again if you flip back um, Kieran just that previous slide and just say again we have both of Jeremy's books available and we'd absolutely love to um, share them um, with you if you want to if you want to get a copy just email the office and we'll make sure that they um, get to you 
Um, so thank you, Kieran. That's brilliant. Well, look, again, um, Jeremy, just thank you so much um, for being so honest and uh, for sharing all of, the, all of that with us. And actually, I think um, you, people can't see this, but if people want to clap at home, people who are on screen, do you want to give Jeremy a clap for joining us? Thank you. There we go. There are people giving you a clap. You can't hear it, Jeremy, but they do appreciate it. They do appreciate it. And look, if you do have any more questions, all those, way, all those areas are ways you can um, follow up with us. And um, Jeremy, we, we trust you have a good rest of the evening. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me. God bless. God bless. Thank you. And thanks to all for joining us.